Uh, well, welcome. Uh, I'm going to start with a disclaimer about me because there's often some confusion about this. I'm a lifelong non-smoker and anti-smoker and I dislike smoke and I nearly got divorced when I tried to stop my wife smoking and she eventually did. And uh, she's never allowed me to forget that I bullied her into it and she considers it an endless anomaly that I now stand up and defend the rights of smokers. And uh, I make no apology for that. Anyone who believes in freedom at all believes in one and only one kind of freedom. Freedom has only one meaning. It means the right of other to people to do things you think they shouldn't do. If you're in favor of other people doing things you, sh you think they should do, then you're not for freedom. Freedom, by definition, is other people doing stuff you don't think they should do. For example, gambling or having certain sexual preferences or political beliefs or uh, doing, you know, dangerous, living dangerous lifestyles, or even for that matter, committing suicide, which is perfectly lawful in South Africa. You're entitled to stick a gun into your mouth, but not a cigarette, which is uh, one of the weird anomalies involved. So, uh, yes, this is no uh, attempt whatsoever to uh, promote tobacco or smoking. Um, Although I, and I will be criticizing in the absence of TISA, that's the tobacco industry who would have been here, so I'm going to criticize them in their absence. I think their capitulation as people who supply a product to the vilification, humiliation, and treatment of their own customers is actually unforgivable. I think they owe it to their customers to defend them, support them, stand up for them, defend their dignity and their rights and they have failed to do so. So I am very critical of the tobacco industry, let's be clear about that, as I would be of any industry, gambling for example, which I also don't do. Um, they ought to come to the defense and legitimation of their customers, the people who pay their salaries. They owe it to them, uh, I think as a matter of principle. And I think the tobacco industry in that sense has been reprehensible. Uh, and I've said that to them. I don't mince my words, and if uh, their representative were here today, we'd have to clash on that issue. So I am uh, just a simple old-fashioned believer in personal freedom and liberty, meaning I believe that you should be able to do what you like with your life, and I should be able to do with mine. And on the question of tobacco, I want to get this out of the way too. I am 100% for the protection of non-smokers, probably more than anyone else in this room. And my position is simple. You are free to wave your fist around in the air, but not where my nose is. Similarly, you are free to blow your smoke around in the air, but not where my nose is. Uh, you can do what you like with your life, including committing suicide and being obese and eating junk food and having sugar and salt and, and using deodorants and doing all of the other things that health fanatics think you shouldn't do. And uh, so I just want to get that principle out of the way, and I hope everyone gets it, that uh, my position is very simple and the Free Market Foundation's position is very simple, that you have uh, the right to do unhealthy things. No one is forced or should be forced by law to be healthy, to live a healthy lifestyle, and I'm going to go through what the implications of that are quite quickly. And I hope, uh, and please feel free to interrupt me as you go if you disagree or you want clarification or whatever it might be. For example, we have experts on the law with us. Thank you very much, two or three. Uh, and you might, if you think I've left out a nuance or got something wrong or whatever, then please tell me. Not everyone in this room agrees. I think we probably all agree on broad principles that there should be human freedom but we probably don't agree on the detail. For example, I know that Senku's position over the years has been uh, to be in favor of uh, tobacco regulation. Uh, but I'm going to try and persuade Senku that the time has come to draw a line in the sand and say enough now. That it it's, it's was when it was legitimate to protect non-smokers. And what's happened is everyone's been caught up in the arguments for health promotion and somehow not seen when it crossed decency lines into being just an extreme invasion of personal lifestyle choice and freedom, and in my view, consumer rights. And I'm really going to try and talk Sanku into saying enough now. We, you've supported it all these years, good for you, but it's now actually become a, a massive violation, I believe, of your constituencies and members' rights. 
and uh, I would like us to engage on that. And I, I, I think it's time for the consumer movement to say, hold on, this is going a bit far now. This is not legitimate anymore. And I'm going to say why I think that's the case. And um, so, so yes, we're, we're delighted to have you. And uh, I'm looking forward to a robust discussion. And it's my job to convince you. I accept I'm up against it. And if I fail, well, then I just wasn't good enough. So um, I'm going to start with what you are doing, and that's sitting. And I don't know if you realize that sitting, according to the World Health Organization and various health authorities, is what they call the new smoking. Uh, sitting has now been found to be as bad for your health as smoking, if not worse. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is require you every five minutes to stand up, and then you can sit down again. But to sit for the duration of this process is according to health experts very unhealthy and you might as well be smoking. So what I suggest you do is you stand up and smoke or you sit. I mean, either way, you're in the same uh, unhealthy position. But let's go into this, this business of sitting. And I'm dealing with it because that's what you're doing and what everyone in this room does a lot of. And you may not be aware of the fact that this is next. If you condone the invasion of personal lifestyle choices on tobacco, you have no principled argument about what will follow, inevitably. And we've seen already with sugar and salt and deodorants and baby foods and additives and flavorants and all of the other things that we are being told how to live our lives, even the flavor of the food that a restaurant may serve is, is, is imminent. That is, the proposals are now before the Department of Health to do exactly that. Um, and this is the sort of propaganda we are seeing now against sitting. The, the, it's become, it's the new uh, area of invasion of lifestyle and behavior. Um, uh, this, for example, is what the uh, Harvard Medical School has to say. Uh, this is a, a copy of a, of, a, of a published paper, and I've just taken this from the internet, a few examples of words. This is their picture, which they've used, not mine. Where's the little button uh, for pointing, the pointing device, I think it's there, yes. And in this column, this is what they, they are showing, is the evils of sitting. And uh, it says, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through it, sitting linked to health disease, diabetes, premature death. Uh, sitting is now really the worst thing you can do. So uh, I did think of having this entire session without any chairs in here. So everyone has to stand around and be healthy and keep our health fanatics, our health Nazis, happy, because that's what they are. They are shameless despots and Nazis. And I'm going to actually have some specific reference to that. And this is the sort of thing you see. The, 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 you know, what is it? The, the death, the, oh, what's this guy called again? Um, the Reaper. The, 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 the Reaper, yeah. Uh, hovering over someone who's sitting. This is how it's becoming. This is the propaganda we saw against tobacco. It's now starting with other stuff, and it's going to have no, there's, there's no end. In the end, it will be compulsory exercise and uh, the prohibition of, uh, of, of reality TV because people sit and watch too much uh, and so on. But the, the, where will it stop? This is, again, an example of the sort of anti-sitting propaganda that's taking place. Now, just I'm trying to remind you of what we used to see about tobacco when reasonable decisions were made uh, in the 1970s and 80s. And this is where it starts, and it's going to end up with controls over sitting. You know, the prohibition of comfortable chairs, for instance, and a chair tax, a sitting tax, like sin tax, a sit tax, uh, is the sort of thing that, that is inevitable uh, to stop sitting. Um, and then there are all the others. We've heard about it. Sugar, uh, salt, uh, fat, uh, liquor, walking. You know, drunk walking is now the big, one of the big no-no's. And that's quite, in a sense, strangely rational because drunk driving is much less a cause of road accidents and deaths than drunk walking. Walking is actually the more dangerous thing to do, walking and cycling. Uh, but so far, nobody's regulated it, and it is now being seriously proposed that uh, cops can stop people walking down the road and do breathalyzer tests to find out if you've had a drink before you were walking to the public transport, which has to be a kilometer away, half a kilometer from where drink is sold. In other words, forcing people to walk drunk 
and then arresting them for doing so. This is what is, uh, is seriously under consideration. Uh, cars, you know, cars should have like tobacco. They should, you shouldn't be able to have nice looking cars. They should all look the same because they're obviously dangerous. Cars are very, very dangerous indeed, more dangerous than tobacco. Uh, and the problem is you subject it more to passive bad driving because people crash into you than you are to passive smoking because people have to smoke in smoke-free areas. So, so other people driving is a much bigger hazard to you than other people smoking. Or if you're a child or a spouse or whatever, other people drinking. So this is the, the uh, you know, so what are we going to have graphic health warnings on cars, pictures on the side of cars of mangled bodies and crushed heads and so on. That's what cars do. Why not put uh, graphic pictures on boring cars, all of which have to look the same. All you're allowed to do is put a small name on the, on the back of the car saying, this one happens to be a Nissan, this one happens to be a Rolls Royce, this one happens to be a, 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 a Merc, but they all have to look the same. This is what's being done with tobacco. This is literally what's being done. And if you do it with tobacco, what is the argument for not doing it to everything else? With wine bottles, why shouldn't they all look identical and ugly and have pictures of rotting lungs on that you have to drink at the dinner table? That is, that is exactly justified by the argument made for tobacco. There is no difference between the two arguments. If there is, let me know. If you accept plain packaging and graphic health warning on cigarettes packets, why not on wine bottles? Why not on motor cars? Why not on, on sweet packets? Why shouldn't all sweets look identical? All biscuits look identical? All cakes look identical? You have to stop them being appealing and attractive because they're unhealthy. That's the argument with tobacco. So it goes. Uh, exercise, it is now compulsory in, in, uh, in North Korea to exercise. It has been compulsory in other countries like China, Nazi Germany. Uh, there's, what's the argument against compulsory exercise? Obesity is worse for you than smoking. So obesity is a worth, uh, worse health hazard, so you should ban obesity. And anyone who's overweight should be put in, an, I don't know, uh, given injections or you know, have some anti-hunger uh, anti pills or something. Uh, but th what would your defense be if you allow them to win the tobacco debate? There is no defense left against absolutely every invasion into personal lifestyle. Uh, entertainment, reality TV, sports, interval, you, you know, there, there would have to be compulsory intervals in movies, for example. A two and a half hour movie, they should say there should be at least four intervals. People have to stand up and walk around and then sit down again because of how dangerous sitting is. It's as dangerous as smoking, according to the World Health Organization. Um, chairs, you know, we would have a sit tax or a comfort tax, a compulsory standing at places of work like here. People who work up and down in the Free Market Foundation, the law will, is going to one day say that the management has to see that everyone stands up every half hour and walks around and then sits down again. And if you don't say that, then you are violating people's so-called right to health, uh, which is the argument with tobacco. Uh, internet. You know, you could, we could have the internet really just cutting down every half hour, stopping, so that people are forced to stand up and not do their emails or their WhatsApps or whatever it might be. Sorry? Stand up and have a smoke break. Have a smoke break, break yes. <laughs> Maybe the internet should force smoke breaks. <laughs> Uh, but this is the sort of thing that's coming. Uh, you know, f fun things, unprotected sex. Uh, this is a much bigger killer than smoking. So why not actually ban unprotected sex? In fact, why not just ban extramarital sex? Or better still, just ban sex other than for reproduction purposes. And then have a reproduction tax because it adds a burden to the government's social cost, which is one of the phony arguments about smoking. Um, and, uh, you know, so adventure stuff, mountaineering, um, uh, mountain biking, um, uh, you know, I climbed Kilimanjaro. People die more at Kiliman climbing Kilimanjaro than they do smoking. It's, it's more risky to climb Kilimanjaro than to smoke. So why not ban it? Why not stop it? Swimming. People uh, drown off the coast swimming, you know, you should actually ban anything, any swimming other than in a baby pond. What are these things called? A splash pond or whatever. Uh, that would be logical. And I want to stress, 
If you accept what is being done with tobacco, you must accept everything else. You have no more argument against it. You have no principled argument against absolutely every invasion of your personal lifestyle. And, uh, you know, there's more. The gambling, uh, deodorants, uh, contact sport, boxing, all of these should be regulated or preferably banned by the same logic of the smoking law. The, in other words, the two are identical. You can just replace, for example, boxing, where they've got smoking or tobacco and so on. So um, let's just get into how this all started. And people tend to forget where the anti-smoking fanaticism was born. In the West, it crept on us slowly by little small measures, the salami technique. You know, a little bit, you slice off a little bit, it doesn't seem too serious. And the salami still seems to be there. And one day the salami is gone. It's finished when you slice off little slices of salami. That's what's happened with personal freedom in the West. In the communist and the fascist countries, they were much more to the point. They, got, they didn't beat about the bush like we have had in the West. Uh, communists in the 1920s launched huge, the Bolsheviks launched huge anti-smoking campaigns. And in case you think this is just me attacking communism, well, so did the fascists. The Nazi Hitler was a big anti-smoking fanatic. And the Nazis uh, uh, were, were... So this, the origins of this come out of, in, in the extreme forms, the, most, the world's most despotic regimes. We have now started doing what they did. In other words, we have reached the level of total despotism total invasion of personal freedom and liberty. And you as a, as a, as a legal drafter and lawyer, uh, you know, would know that you, there's got to be some kind of limit in the Constitution. Now let me say that everyone talks about tobacco control. That's what the Act talks about, controlling tobacco and electronic delivery systems, tobacco products. They do not. You have not seen a health department inspector chase an unruly cigarette down the road. You have not seen a health department inspector catch a le electronic delivery technique which, uh, mechanism which was misbehaving. All control is people control. There is no such thing as tobacco control. Nobody controls tobacco other than a tobacco farmer. And then it's to keep the insects off the tobacco. But all control is, let's understand that when you read that bill, don't get lulled into thinking this is about regulating an inert thing like tobacco. This is regulating people. Regulating people down to what they do in their own bedroom at night. If you employ a domestic worker during the day, one day a week or half a day a week on a Monday, the law says, as it's now drafted, that the following Sunday night you may not lie in bed and light a cigarette in your own bed in your own house when the worker hasn't been there for days. That's how crazy it is. And I, I want to tell you that anyone who reads this bill, and probably very few people do, it is mad. Whoever drafted it literally needs psychiatric treatment. It's nuts beyond con conception, in your own house. Now, let me tell you, I have a domestic worker who uh, comes into a house my wife and I have in Vokestrum, one day a week. The domestic worker is a smoker. We don't mind the domestic worker smoking. The law now says that the domestic worker may not smoke at the workplace because there's a smoker at the workplace, namely herself. Now, how much more nuts can you get than that? I mean, this is about as crazy, as insane as you can get. So we have a woman who comes in when we're not there. We can be away on holiday. She's by herself, and she may not smoke because she smokes. That's really what the law says. Because she's a smoker, she may not smoke. I mean, uh, this is how nuts it is. Uh, and then the, the, I've talked about the salami technique. People are lulled into it, and it was originally about passive smokers. It's no longer anything to do with passive smokers, and I'm assuming most people in this room are probably non-smokers. At the moment, 
we are protected by buildings having indoor ventilated smoking areas. I am not subjected to anyone else's smoke anymore. It's very rare. The law says that all of those places have to be closed. Billions of rands of investment have to be written off in ventilators and facilities and rooms. Those smokers now have to go out in vast numbers. A big building can have a thousand, two thousand smokers. They now are required under this bill to stop working, get the lift down, go out into the street, find some place, you know, you know, somewhere which is 10 meters from an entrance or whatever, gather there in large crowds and smoke through which I will have to walk. This is an invasion of my rights as a non-smoker. I demand that smokers stay indoors in ventilated areas for my protection from their smoke. We now have a law that says, no, they are now going to, I'm now going to have them forced into my space. Now, if you're a non-smoker, this is why I say, this is the time for non-smokers to say, wait a minute, this is no longer about protecting us, this is now about violating us. Non-smokers are now the victims, not smokers, and in many more ways than just that. Um, tobacco policy reduces you to meat. Now, let me explain that. Uh, Minister Motswaledi has said, smoking has no benefits. Now, what does he mean by that? Uh, I've asked people who smoke why they smoke, and they say they like it. Uh, I would have thought something being lacquer is a benefit. I, I think being happy and enjoying yourself is a benefit. I'm for that. I'd like you to have satisfaction. But the point is that your mind is irrelevant now. All you are is a piece of flesh that has to be kept free of chemicals that the government has decided is bad for your flesh and your flesh has to be preserved as long as possible. You might as well put you in a freezer, deep freeze or something. You have no mind, you have no desires, you have no will, you have no uh, lifestyle uh, desires. Now I'm going to get to what the very substantial benefits of smoking are. They are very substantial benefits. And, uh, but if you regard the human body as a piece of nationalized meat, which is what, this, what the law now does, all that's an issue is are you doing some harm to the flesh that is sitting there in those clothes, the meat, not your head, not your mind, uh, and the idea is that it is. So you've become a kind of nationalized zombie, uh, and um, you, you have no bodily integrity, uh, no human dignity, no lifestyle freedom. Now, let's, I'm going to get to the benefits of smoking. Health despots have reduced you to inert meat, literally, flesh. Um, now, well, once benign measures has, has morphed into total despotism, and that's where I believe the consumer movement actually should go back and say, what we originally supported was legitimate, but is this still legitimate? And everyone should do that, all of us. My friends who are anti-smokers, all went along with it. You know, they want to go to restaurants and not sit in the presence of smokers and so on. But they didn't realize that the salami technique just started slicing into their freedom and choice. Uh, and, uh, and so these Orwellian measures, they, they're literally absurd. This I'm going to, before I give some of the absurdities, this is just a list of the causes of death according to Stats SA. Now you can see, and there's a statistician who has for this purpose, you can see some of these are smoking related, tobacco related, most aren't. Most other things are a bigger cause of death. For example, HIV AIDS. Now if you want to regulate smoking, why not regulate sex? What's the argument for not regulating sex? That should then be done. And it's things like hypertension. Hypertension is reduced by smoking. So let's understand that smoking actually has physical health benefits. And, uh, and, so, and some of these others are also probably reduced by smoking. So uh, the, the consumer rights aspect is the uh, Tobacco Products Control Electronic Delivery Systems Bill. Uh, it's not controlling tobacco products or electronic systems. It's controlling people. Let's just understand. This should be called the Control of People Bill or the control of people who come near tobacco bill, or something like that. Uh, 
So uh, the long title mentions nothing about consumers, civil liberties or human dignity. Now this is the mindset of the authors of this, the architects of it. The long title tells you what its objectives are. It makes no reference to the rights of consumers, no reference to the right to human dignity, which is section one of our constitution, the very first section of our constitution, not in the Bill of Rights, which can be qualified by the limitation clause. The clauses outside the Bill of Rights are actually absolute. They're not subject to the limitation. And human dignity is one of those. It doesn't mention it. Then they've got this phony, this completely sham socioeconomic impact assessment. They produced one, and uh, we suspect that it's partly because of us constantly pressurizing and demanding that there be one. They've produced one. It's a complete sham. It makes wild, unsubstantiated, unsubstantiatable claims of benefits. It makes no reference whatever to disadvantages and costs. It makes no reference, to, for example, to the labor implications, unemployment implications. Let me give you a simple example. The prohibition of smoking in a domestic house. If you are a smoker and you now have a domestic worker who comes in maybe, and by the way, it probably applies to a gardener as well. It doesn't even come into the house, but that's not entirely clear. The law is ambiguous. Uh, but let's assume we have a domestic worker in the house and you now have a choice. You either stop smoking in your own home or you fire the domestic worker and you buy a washing machine or whatever it is. Uh, consider the unemployment implications of this. Would you choose, if you're a smoker, to be able to smoke in your own home or without a worker? Or would you ch give up smoking in your own home and walk into the garden because you want a domestic worker? And there, as I say, that domestic worker can be half a day a week and, and still then makes your home a prohibited area. So it's a completely uh, phony socio-economic impact assessment. Particularly, it ignores the health benefits of not smoking. Now, the World Health Organization lists them. It helps people combat depression, loneliness. It gives people satisfaction and pleasure. Uh, it gives people confidence. It helps people socialize. These are, after all, more important than your physical health. What's more important, your mental health, being a happy person, or your physical health, being a healthy piece of flesh, which matters most? And this is, uh, is completely ignored. Uh, the physical health benefits are that mental health brings about physical health. So, for example, people often smoke in order to combat dis eating disorders or drinking disorders. In other words, the smoking can be physically healthy. Uh, and that's uh, completely ignored. It's not touched on. It's not discussed. Although it's on the World Health Organization's website and other health areas will go into why people smoke and what the benefits are. Productivity, it helps people concentrate, it promotes alertness, it, uh, memory tests show that it improves memory, so there are significant benefits to smoking. And then the biggest benefit all is the, what the Constitution envisages, the right to human dignity, freedom, property rights. By the way, all private property has now been declared public property, including your house. It started with declaring rest, private restaurants to be public property. And people like us said, hold on a sec, a restaurant is not public property, it's private. Uh, I'm trying to find somebody to start a smoking compulsory restaurant. I want them to open a restaurant saying, in order to come here, you must be smoking. Why not? I'm not entitled to go into every restaurant. And if smokers want a restaurant where smoking is compulsory, or drinking is compulsory, or being a Muslim is compulsory, whatever it is, uh, uh, why not do it? Or dressing in it. We have dress codes. You may not go into places unless you're suitably dressed. Well, why not also say you may not go into a place unless you're suitably smoking? You see, I mean, what's the difference? Um, so, um, constitutional rights, administrative justice. Now, we're going to get to that. Administrative law absurdities in the, in the draft bill. And transformation. Now, let me deal with this little hidden away word in the bottom right hand corner here. The way the bill is drafted, low income, poor areas, which in South Africa means mainly black areas, essentially will not be able to allow people to sell tobacco products or to consume tobacco products. For example, if you live in Alex Township, there is nowhere in Alex where you can get 10 meters from an entrance. In other words, there is nowhere in Alex where you could lawfully smoke. 
So every smoker in Alex would have to get into a taxi, go and find somewhere else to smoke, and that itself will be quite difficult. Here you can just walk into the garden because this is Brownston after all, it's rich. But in Alex there's no such option. So this is a law written by elites, for elites, as if there are no poor people. And what about, you may not display tobacco products. How does a little spaza shop owner or street vendor sell tobacco products which can't be displayed or visible to consumers? This presupposes a big rich supermarket or cafe. In other words, this bill is utterly elitist and in South Africa that has racial implications. This is utterly racist. It is a violation, extreme uh, violation of uh, the poor, uh, most of whom in South Africa happen to be black people. So Alex Township, just consider this, or most of the locations and townships, a, a huge big squatter settlement, like, like, um, or a place like Ivory Park. You will not lawfully be able to smoke anywhere there. Now, uh, what will happen, of course, as the government well knows, is people will just ignore the law. So this is passing a law knowing in advance everyone will ignore it, which brings the law into disrespect. The government does not respect its own law. It's making a law it has no intention whatsoever of enforcing or applying, and which it knows can't be enforced or applied. That's one of the reasons why it has a provision that owners of premises, for example here, if someone here smokes, indoors, the owner is subject to a 50,000 rand fine, potentially. So the owners are now becoming the police for a law the government knows is crazy and can't be enforced and can't be policed um, and is unenforceable. And that was, I think, the tenor of your discussion with me, that it's really completely unenforceable. So, um, so industry, in my view, has unforgivably abandoned its own consumers, and I think it ought to openly say we defend the dignity and rights and freedom. And, you know, our smokers are being treated, like, our customers are being treated like lepers. They're being called addicts. addicts. Uh, this is a huge insult to people who smoke. And I'm just amazed that the tobacco industry has let this happen, has let their own consumers be slaughtered in this way. Um, uh, they should have been sitting with, the con with you guys talking about what's reasonable and, and I believe they failed to perform that function. Uh, branding. Bra everyone talks about branding as if it's to do with the intellectual property of the supplier. Uh, you know, I know, Camel or whatever, I don't really know what's Stuyvesant, I think. I, I don't really know what tobacco products they are. Uh, but that's not the issue. The purpose of branding is not suppliers. The purpose of branding is consumers. Consumers like a particular brand. If you didn't, you would all buy your shirts at, the, at a warehouse imported from China for a fraction of the price you actually paid for the shirt you are wearing now. And the reason you're wearing the shirt now is because of the branding of the shop you went to and the branding of the product you went to that was important to you and that law now requires that that branding be taken away. Uh, what's that going to do? It's going to mean nobody will have any intention whatsoever, any incentive anymore to, uh, to improve the quality of their products. But more importantly with tobacco, what has already emerged, as we know, is a massive industry of piracy and smuggling. Because if all products look exactly the same, then all products are easy to pirate. So if you can't have a pretty logo that's properly embossed and has gold foil on it and so on and so forth, the consumers are now going to be sold products that are unhealthy. Let's get that clear. These are cheap, rubbishy tobacco products without any of the regulatory controls being observed. And this is being sold now at something like well, 12 billion rand, according to evidence research done by Ipsos, I think it was 12 billion lost in tax revenue through piracy and smuggling, let alone how much is lost to South Africa, lost to legitimate producers, and all of those smokers are now smoking products that have not met any of the regulatory minimum standards for tobacco products. That is, so we are subjecting the poor who buy these products to ill health, 
This is what the, this is what the law is now doing. It's no longer trying to help the people who smoke be healthy. It's now actually forcing the people who smoke to be unhealthy. That's what, what is now happening. Um, graphic warnings, forcing consumers to carry pictures of sick body parts, rotting body parts. And I repeat, if you do it for tobacco, why not alcohol? Why not gambling? Show people, you know, have pictures at casinos, not of pretty lights and things, but of people who've lost everything gambling and are now street uh, bums or hobos living in parks. Everything, you know, uh, motor cars, uh, uh, holiday packages. If you have adventure holidays being advertised, you should show pictures of people falling off cliffs, people being eaten by wild animals. This would be the equivalent of the tobacco graphic warnings. And then <laughs> no more smoke-free areas. Well, this ends, and I really want to stress this, I as a non-smoker am now fully protected. If this bill goes through, I as a non-smoker will have lost my protection. This is what's being, the, the, the proposal is to remove the rights of non-smokers. And I really want to drive that home. People are not getting this point. Um, and um, so there will be no more health. Now, the point is about these electronic tobacco products. It forbids telling anyone that vaping or electronic tobacco products are either completely harmless or overwhelmingly harmless. For example, 95% uh, healthier or you know, almost zero, close to zero. Now you are not, you literally not allowed to do harm reduction. You're not allowed to say someone who smokes, look, if you use this vaping thing instead, as far as we know, it has no negative health consequences, or if they are, they are absolutely minimal. They are less than if you eat a slice of cake a month. Okay, so you may not, the law forbids, bans, Publishing facts, publishing health benefits, it forbids promoting health. That's how crazy it has become. It is now illegal to promote health. That's what this bill has in mind. Uh, and now, what does it do if you may no longer say that product A is healthier or less harmful than product B? It stops any incentive for people to come up with healthy alternatives. This is... This brings an end to the search, the quest for healthy alternatives is, is put to an end here. You, you may no longer come up with something that, that's less harmful or more healthy. It's now banned. That's what's proposed. That's how nuts it is. It's, it's kind of nuts in, on steroids. Um, some of the absurdities. Smoking under this bill, if you say to yourself under this bill, not where is smoking banned now? But where is it allowed? Where could you still lawfully smoke? And the answer is virtually nowhere. And in case you can find somewhere where it actually will be lawful to smoke under this bill, the minister has an open-ended dictatorial despotic power just to declare anywhere that the minister feels like to be also a forbidden area. So if, for example, you walk out here and you stand in the middle of the garden and you're smoking over there, the minister can say, no, gardens in office parks are also banned. There would need be no public debate, no public discord, no reference to the consumer movement, no reference to a portfolio committee in parliament. The minister just sits or lies in bed one day after his smoke uh, and writes a decree saying, in, henceforth, all private property in office parks and factory parks and workplaces is now also banned. Now, I want you to read this bill and to say to yourself, what's left? Where could you lawfully smoke? If you're a rich person living in Bryanston or Constantia, you have a garden into which you can walk and smoke. If you're a poor person living in Ivory Park or Soweto or Kailicha or Langa, there is nowhere where you could lawfully smoke. It is banned everywhere. Again, this is elitist. The rich will be able to smoke and the poor will not be able to smoke. Now, some people might say, that's fine. We don't want the poor to smoke. Let's stop them. Well, then say so. Be honest about it. This is a measure against the poor, which in South Africa, of course, means 
largely black people. The public place ban bans smoking in private places. This here is a private place. I was going to put up signs around here saying smoking welcome. Uh, and for government health department inspectors, it's obligatory. They may not come in unless they smoke. And if they do, they will be arrested for trespassing. Uh, now, I, I'm probably going to put a sign like that up on the front door. Smokers are not really welcome, but I feel a moral obligation to say they are. Uh, you know, have you hugged a smoker today? I mean, these poor people, the way they're treated is really horrific. I think we all have to go out and hug a smoker and tell them, don't worry, we like you. Some people love you. You're not really all bad. Um, and so... Enclosed workspaces are banned. Now, what does that mean? You'd think an enclosed workspace is here, right? <laughs> well, interestingly, this doesn't fall under the definition of an enclosed workspace because it says it has to be a square. This is a rectangle uh, or a circle. So if, if your workplace is in the shape of, a, of a, a pentagon or a star or whatever, apparently smoking is allowed if the workplace has a certain shape, but not another shape. But it also includes if there are is there's a curved wall and you extend the wall that it will eventually complete a circle. So in other words, it doesn't have to actually be one. It can just be like a, a little thing, you know, this long. But if you extend the wall all the way around, it will eventually create an enclosed space. That's banned. You may not smoke inside that imaginary area. Or if you're in a carport with a temporary roof, and there's a wall on two sides made of canvas with, you know, spaces all around. May not smoke. So now an enclosed space is defined in, in a way that no reasonable human being could think it's defined. No reasonable person could accept the definition of a so-called enclosed space. It is obvious nonsense if you read it. And if you have no idea what it means, I mean, it says circles and squares. I didn't read it carefully enough. Uh, Martin, to work out if, if rectangles are included or oblongs. I mean, if you have a workplace the shape of a rugby ball, for example, can you smoke there? I, I mean, I, I don't know. It's got to be squares. Squares are geometric phenomena. Um, then in your own home, I've dealt with that. And then uh, the arbitrary despotism where the minister can just simply declare anything that's left to be uh, an illegal workspace. And then confectionery and toys that resemble tobacco products. Now, quite what that means, heaven alone knows. Uh, it doesn't have to be like those little sugar cigarettes you used to get. This is just something that, according to some arbitrary official somewhere, looks like a tobacco product. So something that looks like a vaping device. Uh, I think, you know, it's like deodorant sprays and so on look like vaping devices. Will they be banned? Because they look like tobacco products. Uh, so uh, nobody's thought about this. Some nutcase wrote this stuff who didn't think about what it means or the implications. Probably, I don't know, I don't know where they got their law degree if they have one. And I doubt if they do. I don't know what they are qualified to do other than to put words on paper regardless of their implications. And I, I want you to look at this bill. It's nonsense. Page after page is nonsense, and the socio-economic impact assessment is even more. I don't know what's disappeared down the bottom of the page here. Does it go down any further? <coughs> it's uh, Oh, yes, <laughs> the bill has the strange provision. Uh, now, how do you like this? There is one place that smoking is allowed, explicitly. This is where you may smoke, in a rehabilitation center. Now... I just think, hold on a sec, <laughs> my daughter is mentally ill and she's been in a rehabilitation center. Uh, now everyone can go and smoke there. Uh, again, if the, if the only place in which you may smoke is where people are being rehabilitated, then there's something really weird about the authors uh, and the architects of this bill. And so the absurdities go as vendors may not display their products. This is a violation of the right of consumers to know what products are available, and it humiliates consumers. Consumers now have to walk up and say, I want to buy tobacco products. Now, I remember when I was a little boy, condoms were sold in little silver tins, 
and I forget what they were called, but uh, you, you, and we little boys. FLs. Sorry? FLs. FLs, yeah. French letters. And the little boys used to collect money together and go into a chemist and say, I want some FLs. And they'd put the 25 to, to, to half a crown or whatever it is on the counter. And anyone who bought condoms, was, it was embarrassing. It was awkward. They couldn't be displayed. You didn't know whether they were or weren't available anywhere. And that's now being done to consumers of tobacco products. They're being treated like people of sex products. Condoms used to be treated, which was humiliating and insulting and a violation of their rights. Um, so it's anti-small business. Basically, small businesses will, for various reasons, be unable to comply. Vending machines will be banned even where the only people there are over 18. So in other words, if you're in a bar or a, or a place where it's over 18s only, uh, you may not, still may not have a vending machine there. Um, and what that means is, of course, that, uh, that um, it's less accessible, it's less accessible during hours. So if you're a smoker, you know you can't stop at a vending machine and get your cigarettes. So what you do is you buy more, you stock up, you build up stock, there's more available. Again, a measure that is extremely probable that it's going to be entirely counterproductive. It'll achieve the opposite of what is supposedly intended. Um, and you may not indicate safe or sake of smoking. In other words, there's banning, prohibition of information. It's banned. You may not draw people's attention to uh, safer products, better products. You may not even draw people's attention to the difference between a legitimate cigarette and a pirated cigarette. Um, you cannot say yours is healthier. You may not associate healthiness with a healthy product or a less harmful product. It's like saying motor car manufacturers may not advertise that they have uh, special braking systems or they have airbags. They may not advertise that their car is less dangerous than another car. That's the logic. It's like saying you may not say this new BMW is, is less dangerous than our previous one. That is now forbidden. Yeah. Or you may not say you will not. They soon get there. You, it's like saying you may not say this is sugar free or low sugar or low alcohol. You see, so, so if you may not say something is less harmful or is more safe, that's what this bill does. It pro prohibits you doing that. Um, Online sales will be banned. Uh, I could go into that. Enclosed temporary areas, etc., and vehicles with... Oh, this is a weird one. I read this thing three or four times, and I couldn't work out what it's saying. It says that if you're in a vehicle with an under-18 person and another person, then the, you can't smoke in the vehicle. Now, I'm not sure what that means. If I'm the driver and I have an under-18 person, then I may smoke. But if there's another person in the vehicle as well, then I may not. I'm not sure quite what the logic is of that, that if you're only one person. So what does another person in the vehicle mean? Does it mean you, the driver? Do under-18 people sit in vehicles without the a driver? What, what, I mean, it's, a, it's like a kind of a... You read this thing and you think, what are they trying to say? I mean, it's not even... With the best will in the world, you actually can't work out what they want it to say. That it doesn't actually say anything meaningful is a different thing entirely. And then there are various anomalies. Uh, owners have to, uh, you know, are liable to fines. Uh, it's completely unenforceable. Uh, health fascists at the gate uh, thought that... So I think this is the point. Actually, what has now really happened is the true colors of the anti-smoking fanatics have become apparent. What they really do is they hate anyone being happy or pleasurable or satisfied. They, they hate the thought that somewhere someone is happy. Everyone has to be permanently miserable and stressed out about the quality of their meat, their flesh. They may not actually just be content because they're having, a, after a hard day's work, having a relaxing puff. Or uh, if they're stressed out or trying to concentrate, cramming for exams or whatever it might be. Or... Just to give you an example of where smoking has very considerable benefits, drivers, people who do long distance driving, truckers, reps of companies, the biggest danger to them is fatigue. And the biggest solution to fatigue is smoking. You light up, it keeps you awake and alert. That's what they do. 
So you ban smoking, you could expect more accidents, more fatalities, especially of people who drive long distances. And, uh, and so these health fanatics don't care about that. Nowhere do they talk about it. They never mention it. They just can't stand the fact that somebody has a sweet tooth, that somebody likes eating, that somebody likes wine with meals, that somebody likes salt, well, salted butter. You know, we're going to have unsalted butter will become compulsory and so on. So this is really what it's about. It's really about killjoy fanatics, people who can't stand the thought that someone somewhere is happy or content or satisfied or relaxed. That's really what this is all about. Just I want to point this out, which is long since forgotten. Anything that is dangerous, Paracelsus law, well-known law in healthcare, is that the poison is not in the dose. Nothing is inherently poisonous. One uh, molecule of uranium is harmless, or plutonium, or whatever. But a cupful will kill you. One molecule of arsenic is harmless, but a tablespoon will kill you. So the point is that we all know that the quantity determines the health risk. Too much water is fatal, kills you, not just because you drown, that's true, but there's a thing called water poisoning. If you drink too much water, it's actually fatal, it can kill you, uh, because your body can't handle it and you die, and people have died from drinking too much water. So everything in lots of quantity is deadly, and everything in a little bit of quantity is harmless. Between the two, there are thresholds. In other words, what they should say, if they really mean to promote our health, is smoke by all means, but not more than one a day, or not one more than one every second day, or not more than... But come up with what, in fact, does the science tell us is healthy and unhealthy smoking. Not all smoking is unhealthy. Lots of smoking is unhealthy. And what is lots of smoking? Like, lots of salt is unhealthy, and lots of sugar is unhealthy, and lots of fat is unhealthy, and so on and so forth unless you're into banting, which maybe means that we have to change our mind and say lots of bread is unhealthy because now carbs are the bad thing. So we need to ban bread. And so it goes. So let's say the ultimate crime you can commit is to be an obese drinker with a sweet tooth, smoking at a braai, watching TV without a crash helmet. I mean, that's really uh, uh, what you should never do. Um, and these, this is the kind of anti-sitting propaganda. Just to, I, I want you to really understand where this is going. <laughs> it's not to do about tobacco anymore. It's now to do about lifestyle, every aspect of your life. So with that, uh, I'm done. And you all listen. Nobody interrupted. I don't know if that's because I wasn't making sense or because maybe I was. But uh, thank you very much. Now we go into not a Q&A at all but workshop mode. And in order to do that, I want to suggest the following. If people want to think more about it and look into it, I, I keep, I'm sorry, but very to thank you because you've long friends of the foundation for 40 years and we've come a long road together. We would love to come and have a workshop with you and share information and share discussion and see whether Senku is willing to say what you legitimately supported for many years is no longer something that Sanku can support. And I, I think there's a case to be made for Sanku revisiting this issue on behalf of your consumers without compromising your non-smokers. No question of that. That's not an issue. But everyone else, uh, you know, the, the uh, small business organizations, the um, civic associations, uh, we are in consultation, for example, with Sanko, the civic association, uh, with residents associations, especially in poor areas. These are the people who matter. Uh, the, the community committee of a very big shanty town called Marathon and Delport in Kuruleni, one of the biggest and poorest in South Africa. We pointing out to them what the implications are. If the law is enforced, of course, they say to us, it won't affect us because nobody's ever going to enforce the law. Yet, so what does it matter? They can say what they like. Uh, but the trouble is they're going to pay more and then uh, they will be bribed by police who will come to a spaza owner and say, you're displaying your tobacco products. And there will be bribery, corruption, abuse, intimidation and victimization of people who have the wrong political views or the wrong religious views or the wrong relatives. Uh, this is what this law will unleash. So 
Yes, so what we want to do is really say, everybody should make a submission, even if just your own private letter in this room. But you should write to them by the deadline, which is the 9th of August, and say what you think. And you can say you like the idea generally, but you have a concern about some elements, or I would argue, encourage you to consider saying this is just a bad, rotten measure and should be scrapped. Um, and I think the case can be made for that. You might well be a victim of having this bracket creep, this sort of salami technique of not having at some point seen what was actually happening. Um, but yes, uh, uh, let's have a, a discussion, uh, questions. We've got some technical experts in the room. And what we don't know in this room, we will find out for anyone who wants the information. We have the volunteer services of two statisticians who will give us you know, analysis of the data. And, uh, and, and we can help literally to the point of if someone wants us to volunteer a draft, for example. You know, what could your organization reasonably submit? Which we are helping others with who don't have research facilities and, and so on. So we, uh, that's what we do. We in the Free Market Foundation help uh, other organizations and individuals make submissions by giving information and even volunteering drafts. Um, and we dealing with some big organizations on this. For example, I'm, I'll mention one, NAFCOC. The, the, the biggest black owned black business organization in South Africa, been around for many years, very influential, very close to the ANC, very politically integrated with the ANC. It has come out against this bill. So, and uh, it's taken a very strong stand, saying this is completely unacceptable, even though in the past NAFCOC was sympathetic with tobacco control laws and said this is no longer legitimate. And uh, so, over to you. Thanks for your attention. Yes, Anthony, but I'm not going to sit up here. I think what we might do is try and create more of a circle or something.